So my name is Erica Larkins, and I'm the director of the Boehner Stiefel Center for Brazilian Studies at San Diego State University. Um, today's event coincides with an important day in Brazil, Black Consciousness Day. It is celebrated on November 20th, so we're a little bit early, but we're celebrating it all week this week. Um, and it's the anniversary of the assassination of Zumbi dos Palmares at the hands of the Portuguese colonists. At the same time, Zumbi was the king of Quilombo dos Palmares, a settlement of Africans and their descendants who had liberated themselves from slavery. Today, Zumbi is a symbol of resistance and freedom. Today's panel discussion, Race, Racism, and Resistance in Latin America, Afro-Brazilian Struggle for Citizenship, is the third event in a lecture series on Afro-Latinidad that we are co-hosting with the Center for Latin American Studies this semester. Today's event is also sponsored by the Department of Africana Studies. I wanna say thank you to Ramona Perez, Rebecca Bartel, Crystal Bivona, Flavia Suarez, and Brooke de la Dola Bella for support in making this event possible. And of course, thank you to our panelists. We're really pleased that you're here. This event, like all of our virtual events, is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the website of our new Digital Brazil project and on our YouTube channel. So please follow us on that site and make sure you tell all of your friends who couldn't come to the live lecture um, that they can watch it after there. Because we're also celebrating International Education Week this week, I wanna share um, the Program on Brazil's course offerings for spring, spring 2021. Cal 222, Art, Sport, and Culture in Contemporary Brazil, that's the flyer on the left there, um, is an introductory Brazilian studies course that examines several aspects of Brazilian culture and cultural production, including art, music, and cinema. Sustainability Studies 496, with that great flyer in the middle. The Amazon is the center of the world, explores indigenous rights, environmental conservation, and sustainable development by looking at scholarship and cultural production from and about the Amazon. And we are also offering a one credit Capoeira course, Cal 296. All of our courses are currently open for enrollment. So before I introduce our speakers, I just wanna say a quick word on the format. Um, you're in a webinar, so um, we're gonna use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to have the panelists are going to talk and have a discussion and then we're going to open up for questions. So please submit any questions that you have in that Q&A box um, and know that we'll, we will get to them um, after the, the presentations and some roundtable discussion among the participants. So now without further delay, let me introduce our speakers. Abner Francisco Soteños is a PhD student in Latin American history at the University of California, San Diego. His research examines Afro-Brazilian political activism in Cold War era Brazil and state surveillance apparatuses during the same period. Monique Paula is a graduate student in media and everyday life at the Universidade Federal Fluminense in Niterói, Brazil. Paula's research analyzes political trajectories of black congresswomen in Brazil through social media visibility and their role in the political arena. And Watu Fani Po is a PhD candidate in Africana Studies at Brown. His research focuses on Black LGBTQA plus activism in the United States and Brazil to understand Black queer and trans social and political activism in both countries. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much to the three of you and we really look forward to this conversation. I'm gonna hand it over to Abner who's going to um, start us off. I think. <laughs> I think he's going to start us off. There he is. Okay, he's going to start us off. <laughs> Welcome and thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Larkins and uh, Dr. Bivana and uh, Flavia Soares as well. Uh, it's an uh, honor to be here in Benfti's uh, Brazilian program, uh, Center for Bra Brazilian Studies program, uh, with uh, Monique 
Paula and what funny and the uh, every other you know person here that joined us today to discuss important aspect of uh, Brazilian history. So I would like to provide an overview about Brazilian history and uh, how black people and the indigenous people or subaltern group have been facing racism, inequality, and also how they have been uh, struggled against this sort of uh, uh, situation. On Sunday, Brazil ended its local election that took place in more than five and a half uh, thousand municipality across the country. The overall outcome was symbolic for grassroots movement, especially for those linked to the LGBT community and the Black movement. However, the reality of uh, LGBT population in Brazil, it's quite threatening for this community. According to research, Brazil is the leader of murder of uh, LGBT people. Transphobia is among the biggest motivation for these crimes. Likewise, Afro-Brazilian population is the main victim of uh, state violence. Just to give it all, uh, to give you all an example, Afro-descendant population in the US is about 13% of uh, total population. I think uh, you can see in a, in a chat on, on my screen. Uh, and uh, while in Brazil, Afro descendant are about uh, five, uh, five percent, it means 55 percent of the whole population. That is, while Afro descendant in the US is a minority group, in Brazil it is quite opposite. Afro Brazilian is the biggest ethnic racial group uh, over there. Uh, as you can see in my slide, the comparison between uh, the comparison at but Brazilian population by ethnic racial group. Um, we have uh, there here black and the brown and mixed race. It's comprised Afro Brazilian population, right? That is sort of uh, fifty five percent of the whole population in Brazil right now. Last year, Brazil police force killed. 17 times more Afro-descendant than to here in U.S. Uh, in 2019. Yet it is about Brazilian election last Sunday, right? And uh, next, please. Yeah, it is about Brazilian population, right? Brown and multiracial population, 43% and Black, 6%, right? It means that uh, brown and multiracial, I am a, according to this graph, I am a multiracial uh, Brazilian, right? But uh, these two groups represent the Afro-Brazilian Afro population. Uh, so uh, back to the data about uh, how police force haven't been killed um, Afro descendant in US and Brazil. So last year, as I said before, uh, police force killed in Brazil 17 times more Afro descendant than uh, the US police force. In Brazil, police fatally shot for thousand and a half uh, Afro Brazilian last year. This number corresponded to about 75% of uh, total death of police force in 2019. I said 
5%, 75% of uh, total death of police force in Brazil last year uh, was Afro-Brazilian. Here in the US, police killed 259 African-American across the country. The number uh, reached 24% uh, of total police killing in this country last year. Now, during COVID-19 pandemic, the number of deaths in Brazil favelas caused by police force increased significantly. In Sao Paulo, for instance, the number of killing made by police force in favela increased by 53% during the pandemic when compared to the same period in 2019. Both in the US and the Brazil, in Brazil, the COVID pandemic deadly affected much more Afro-descendant than any other ethnic racial groups. Historically, Afro-descendant and native people have been the main marginalized group throughout the America. It includes the US, Canada, and the Caribbean. Almost all the modern nation project across the America, exception for Haiti, sought to guarantee a white supremacist ideology along the lines of European colonized capitalism. For this reason, these societies are still strongly identified by uh, patriarchalism and the structural racism that place black and indigenous women among the most vulnerable group in several aspects of their lives. In similar condition of uh, vulnerability are also those groups that play womanhood in some ways, such as gay and queers, uh, or better say, in Brazilian case, travestis. In this case, again, because of racism and uh, patriarchalism, black gays, trans women, and travestis are more are among the most vulnerable groups, uh, as I said before. The last decade of uh, the 20, 20th century in Brazil were not favorable for democracy and subaltern groups. The country lived under military rules during a dictatorship that lasted 20 years, uh, 21 years from 1964 to 1985. After that military dictatorship, many civilian government embraced new liberal uh, policy that limited rights, widened social and racial inequality. However, in 2003, a popular left-wing party called work parties or pity parties on the presidential election and uh, ruled Brazil for about 13 years. During that period, the state increased social, political, and the civil right. Despite uh, the effort of the PT party to tackle structural racism, misogyny, uh, the rate of violence against Afro-Brazilian and LGBT population remained extremely high. Brazil now has the third largest prison population in the world, behind only the US and China. However, in 2016, the PT party was overthrown by a coup d'etat led by political force within the justice system, parliament, mainstream media outlet, and big companies such as banks. The 2016 soft 
school, uh, destabilized, uh, destabilized the country, the domestic politics. It allowed the victory of uh, a far right wing coalition led by Jair Bolsonaro. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro government nowadays combine a sort of uh, military rhetoric with a new liberal politics. That is, Bolsonaro government is the sum of the most dangerous project that ruled Brazil in recent times. Uh, despite the violence spanned by structural racism and uh, patriarchal logic, subaltern groups don't live in a state of political apathy. On the contrary, they have been creating countless strategies and uh, alliances to resist hegemonic groups. The black population in Brazil, for instance, has been faced multiple violations against itself. Social uh, movement uh, as black feminist movement, hip hop, samba, Brazilian funk, popular educators, quilombola community, that means uh, maroon communities, Black scholar from the past and the present have been think of about uh, and propose possibility to ban the genocide of a Brazilian black youth and gender violence as well. They affirm a society that recognize or must recognize Afro-Brazilian and the native people as a fundamental part of what Brazil is today in its most powerful and fraternal dimensions. At the same time, Afro-Brazilian has been inviting progressive white people and other ethnic groups to build up uh, anti-racist and the truly democracy coalition. So to uh, talk more, more about this situation or current Brazilian uh, background in terms of race and gender and race, I so pleasure to invite Monique Paula to speak with us for about 15 minutes for now. Join us, Monique. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Abner. Uh, the, the information is, is hard. Um, all the time we, we know, we hear about the, the statistic of Brazil, it's hard for us, but it's necessary um, um, to necessary to to put to put to fox on, and the, for for we way to change to transform the real situation. I you um, I you share my presentation. more moment I think it's always uh, okay yeah it's perfect thank you so uh, I'm Monique good evening uh, for our audience in Brazil good afternoon for our, our the audience in USA I'm Monique Paula I'm a master student at a postgraduate program in media and everyday life at a Federal Fluminense University, Brazil. Uh, I conduct my research with 
Dr. André Medrado and Dr. Renata Souza and Dr. Carla Baiense. And for me, so special stay with us, discussion, important question for Brazilian people and the worldwide. Uh, about my, my, about the Afro-Brazilian struggle for citizens, citizenship, uh, I will share some, some, some aspect of my research that I conduction in my student at uh, Rio de Janeiro. I have been working about the exposed visibility uh, regime for black women, parliamentaries in the political share, in political share, a case study of the use of the Instagram by National Council uh, Talira Petroni. Uh, there is a, um, I developed the, the, this research with five important session topics. One of them, Culture of Fear by Glassner, 2003. Black Population Genocide, Nascimento, 1978. Necropolitik by Mambembe, 2018. Political Feminicide by Souza, um, 2019, and the invisibility versus hypervisibility by Noble, uh, 2013. And I, I, I bring the message by Nina Simone. Nina Simone uh, give this message. I will tell what is the freedom to me? Freedom for Nina Simone is no fear. And the, why I, I bring this message uh, by Nina Simone? Because it, uh, it's very important to speak about the culture of fear and the, is the impact on society, society and the culture. Uh, fear uh, is an instrument to use propose in society. Fear, it's a lucrative security companies and business. Fear is, is used to justify projects aimed at offering access to guns and weapons. Fear used to justify the adoption of necropolitics by Akitili Mambembe, the death of people from marginalized group becomes an actual state police. Uh, in, this, uh, in this point, I, I bring the, the post of Instagram by Talira Petroni. Talira Petroni is a national uh, National Congress, uh, National Council uh, at Brazil. And at a moment, Talira Petroni is being protected police at the death through it uh, to struggle for racism, women rights, LGBT rights, and a, a popular political project for Brazil. Uh, this uh, uh, is a manifest, interna international manifest in support to Taliria. Uh, and Taliria uh, said for us, attacks on women and black body should not be naturalized in any context, including the, the exercise of parliamentary mandates and in the electoral process. Uh, so uh, to, to struggle against of a culture of fear, Talira Petroni uh, said for us again, the fear has to be transformed into resistance. 
consider uh, consider the continual urgency of resistance. I draw attention to new technology and the other possibility. Social media can play the role of providing space and voice to marginalized group. Many activists often are, are organized around a common case. And so she, as they struggle against police brutally, or a common identify social as black women group. In this way, digital technology can offer various means by which marginalized communities are be able to share the words, uh, the imagine and video in order to gain attention for rights public. Uh, that's why uh, the objective of my research is the uh, the analyze the impact of social media visibly on Talia Petronic works. Uh, in this in, in this imagine, you can see the 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 Talia Petronic profile by Instagram and the, in, in the profile in this link you can see can found the international manifest and the more information about uh, the the dangerous situation that Talia live in now and the uh, can can uh, help with support now. Sorry. With this link. Um, and the, in, in this moment, we can, can, can ask why the visitor is important to black women. Uh, there are 50, 50 seats in city council of Rio de Janeiro. And the last election, 2016, just seven women uh, were occupied this, this seat. And in the next, next year, the, the last Sunday, uh, just 10 women were elected. Uh, just 10 women will occupy the seats in the, in the city council of Rio de Janeiro. And if you, if you consider black women in the last election, the number is two black women. And one of them was brutally murdered. Uh, in this year, the number is four. Uh, just four black women were elected for the seat, uh, seats in the city council. Um, this number is very, uh, is very, uh, large for the really population of of uh, of Brazil and of Rio de Janeiro. So uh, to speak about the visibility and the regime, sorry, and the regime of visibility, you need to. It's necessary uh, to keep in mind what happened the. Um, the Brazilian national uh, policy in this moment. Brazil represents an interesting test case to analyze the multiple, multiple sets of visually. I have elected two presidents, progressive president, presidents, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff, for two consecutive term uh, term it. The Works Party, Partido dos Trabalhadores PT, was removed from power in 2016 with the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff. In October uh, 2018, a far, far right population, Jair Bolsonaro, was elected, making a significant right shift 
in a context the in a context of riot rioting political instability and the economic crisis many fundamental rights have been under attack with an increased persecution of social movement leader alternative journalists journalists and the left leaning political among the others and the same the same year the Jair Bolsonaro was elected. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro was elected in October uh, 2018. Before October 2018, in March, Marielle Franco, a black and lesbian city council woman uh, in the city, Rio de Janeiro, was brutally murdered. And the crime remains unsolved. In this picture, uh, in this, uh, this picture, you can see in the mid, uh, see in the middle, Marielle Franco, in the her last moments before getting murdered, with four shots in the hand. We can, we can, we can feel. Uh, uh, you can. Uh, feeling, feeling and action of your resistance about the resistance and the uh, and the the legacy of Marielle is conduction in the in the our our country in the city and the um, in 2018 her party uh, the party uh, the Liberty and Social Socialism Party, PSOL, decided to adopt a radical strategy to in increase the representation of black women in the, in, in the political. Lauting then, a candidate to occupy is seat in the city council and the uh, Congress. The strategy was provided successful in Rio de Janeiro. Three black women were elected at the state level. Dani Monteiro, Monica Francisco, and Renata Souza, and one black women were elected at a national level, Talira Petroni. In, in this point, we can see this, this woman uh, in, the first, in the first picture. We can see Dani Monteiro, Dani Monteiro. Monica Francisco in the middle, Monica Francisco and Renata Souza. And the, the t-shirt we can, can read is Stopping Kill Us. And after picture, you can see Talira Petroni, uh, a black woman in the Brazilian National Congress mostly masculine and right space. And the, this woman uh, becoming popular known as Marielle Cid. And the Marielle Cid is uh, uh, from uh, the, the, the recent election last Sunday, we 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 have um Tainá de Paula, Tainá de Paula and the Thais Ferreira, Thais Ferreira. Uh, black progressive woman was elected uh, last Sunday. Um, so uh, think about the think about the hypothesis of me, my research. I work with two few uh, about the visibility. Uh, visibility, one point, visibility, through action in so uh, social network, Instagram, can be working a tool to promote it, uh, to action and of mandate and to be elected. And verse visibly can also represent a super violence device, uh, device by hiding agents for power. 
uh, that's why uh, it's very important to speak about the culture of Fifi as a tool political for intermediate, uh, black intermediate, intermediate women and in special black women in this political scenario. So think about the develop of the marginalized population and the new technology, I ask. What is Atalia Petroni's strategy for right to right visibly on social media? And when does she manage to reach higher level of visibility? What are the positive and the negative implications of this? In order to answer this question, I draw with in, in that interview with her, Talia Petroni, and with digital ethnographic uh, observation in her second profile. With this research, I hope to gain insight how social media visibly can be used as a tool uh, to fight racism and to protect women and women rights in a context in the context of fear and the uncertainty. Taliria, for, Taliria said for us, the fight against political violence of gender and the race is a tax uh, is a tax for all is a tax for all of us. So I finish uh, the, the the first moment. Uh, thank you, thank you, Abner. What a funny, please. <laughs> wow, great, Monique. Thank you so much. It is so uh, important discussion. Right, so in the era of social media, uh, when we complain, you know, sometimes about uh, fake news, hate speech, and the other bad things that, you know, social media, you know, that appear sometimes social media like Facebook or Twitter or even Instagram for instance, but you invite us to, you know, thinking about possibility of a social media, especially as a weapon against uh, black women invisibility. And also, especially in the country where, uh, you know, traditional parties uh, didn't share you know, among Black people, especially Black women, the same amount of uh, resource, money, you know, to they care uh, their, you know, process of election. So social media has been an important tool to think about or to provide, you know, visibility uh, for black women and the other uh, under representative groups in Brazil. Thanks a lot. We will talk about we will back to talking about that. Uh, but for now, I would like to invite my uh, dear friend and also as Monique, uh, black activist uh, and the scholar as well, like Monique. What funny poll. Uh, please join with us and uh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Abner. And I'm so excited to be able to, to converse with both Monique and Abner at, at, uh, in the Q&A session because I learned so much and I think it was really important the ways that their talks were contextualized. I think it connects a lot with the things that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and so I'm really excited for the Q&A exchange that's gonna happen in a bit. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Uh, shoot, okay, let's do that. Okay. And we are, okay. 
So I want to say thank you to, to Abner, to the Center for the Latin American Studies, the Center for Brazilian Studies, and the Department of Africana Studies um, at San Diego, San Diego State for this uh, invitation to speak tonight and to present a little bit on my research. Um, this presentation is based on education research that is currently in process. Um, I'm in the process of uh, finishing up research and also writing. Um, my, my presentation and my dissertation is entitled Resisting Fragmentation, the Radical Possibilities of Black LGBTQ Activism in Brazil and the United States. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Brown University. Um, I work with Keisha Khan Perry, um, James Green, Mar uh, Marlon Bailey at Arizona State, and Anani Zizenio, who unfortunately passed in this past month. And so I want to dedicate this presentation to him because it, none of this research would have, been, would have been possible without his amazing research. And anybody who knows Anani, who knows his research, knows that he's extremely influential in the field of Afro-Latin American studies. And so I, I personally want to thank him for all that he's given um, to me and so many others. Um, OK, so let's get in. Uh, so for the structure of this presentation, I'm going to begin by talking about uh, two contextualizing examples that point to the research that I'm, the, the larger overall themes that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about in my research. Then I'll talk through my research questions and themes, the theoretical interventions that I'm making with this, this research, and then the political motivations that are driving this research. Okay. So in July, in July of 2016, Diego Vieira Machado, pictured here, uh, a Black gay student activist from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, was killed in what appeared to be a hate crime. Black and LGBTQ activists claimed his death as both a racist and homophobic attack, channeled their outrage into organized action. <clears throat> they charged that Machado's social location as Black gay and a working class scholarship recipient marked him as a target on three fronts. And any response to his death had to reckon the specific challenges that people who live at the intersections of these social positions face. Black LGBTQ social media groups encouraged people to spread pictures, uh, spread pictures with the words bolded against a black screen, respeitas vicious pretas or roughly translated, respect black sissies. As a way to support and to mourn the enti entirety of who Machado was. Through this, black queer activists also sought to locate Machado's queerness in the colloquial language of the black working class communities in which he came. Identifying the attack against Machado, not as an attack on gay people, that's against bichas pretas, a term largely understood as offensive, but reclaimed within Black LGBTQ working class communities, allowed Black LGBTQ people to control their narrative, even in this moment of violent terror. During that same year, Black LGBTQ activists in Philadelphia rose their voices in discontent against a series of racist events in the city's neighborhood, gay and lesbian district. Following an on-camera, following an on-camera incident, sorry. Following an on cam, uh, an on-camera incident in which anti-black vitriol was spewed by the owner of a popular black gay club, Eye Candy. Black LGBTQ activists from the Black and Brown Workers Collective led boycotts and act actions against racism, not only at Eye Candy, but across the neighborhood. As boycotts continued, the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations instituted a mandatory training on racial discrimination for all businesses and organizations throughout the neighborhood. As tensions rose, the staff at the Mazzoni Center, an LGBTQ nonprofit in the area, decided to walk out in protest of their CEO. Abdul Ali Muhammad, a former Mazzoni staff person and member of the Black and Brown Workers Collective, pledged to go on a medication strike, refusing to take their HIV medication until the CEO was dismissed. Speaking on their motivations for their actions, they stated, 
I quote, as a black queer pause person in the United States of oppression, I have to resist, fight for my humanity and others all while trying to survive and not die from unwavering targets on my back. After the, invest after the resignation of the CEO and continued boycott of eye candy and other neighborhood bars, the Philadelphia Office of LGBT Affairs in conjunction with activists of color throughout Philadelphia unveiled a new symbol of, LGBT of the LGBT community and struggle in Philadelphia, a rainbow flag adding the colors black and brown to represent communities of color. As a result of persistent resistance, black LGBTQ activists in Philadelphia won the flag as a symbol against persistent racism in the LGBTQ community. So it's these moments of Black, queer, and trans resistance that I locate my research in Brazil and the United States. I ask the following questions and, 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 and I ask the following questions within my research and follow these themes. The first theme, self-making and community making. How do different forms of institutionalized anti-Blackness, heteropatriarchal violence, and capitalism shape the tactics Black LGBTQ activists use to defend their lives? So my project examines self-making and community-making through an analysis of Black LGBTQ activists' linguistic choices relating to questions of identity, aesthetics, and decisions about kinship and community alignment for Black LGBTQ activists. Brazil and the United States represent two countries built on chattel slavery and continued, continued anti-Black ideologies aimed to restrict and control the erotic lives of African descended populations and to constrain their full integration into society. These systems of terror continued through modern day police brutality, sexist, and homophobic, has sexist, homophobic, and transphobic violence heightened towards Black people and persistent poverty rates. And so Abner talked a little bit about this in his presentation, showed the statistics of how in Brazil and in the United States, these, both of these country deal, countries deal with extreme amounts of violence to control their Black populations. In the face of multifaceted layers of oppression, Black queer and trans people refusing the negative definitions of their communities as deviant and finding moments of self and collective definitions in their own terms represent moments of resistance. As Black queer and trans people have noted to me during research in Brazil, utilizing terms like bicha preta as reclaimed and redefined collective identities for Black LGBTQ communities become moments of, moments of self and community definition against imposed definitions. I pay close attention to these moments of self-making and community making throughout my research. Navigation of space. How do Black LGBTQ people's social position and worldview and worldview helped them to push radical justice movements and LGBTQ liberation movements to become more expansive, to have more expansive renderings of resistance. So for marginalized communities living at the intersections of multi multiple axes of oppression, choosing, one organi choosing an organizing space can be a painful war between one's identities. For Black LGBTQ people, aligning politically with LGBTQ advocacy groups oftentimes can mean silencing issues connected to one's racial identity, while working with Black organizations can mean facing homophobia within one's activism. Forming autonomous Black LGBTQ spaces might lead to, uh, to the inability to reach one's activism across all or aforementioned communities. In my own research, I give attention to how Black LGBTQ activists navigate working within these multiple kinds of organizations and how they continue to fight for full recognition of the multiple systems of oppression that shape their lives. Freedom manifesting. How do Black LGBTQ activists organize and enact their own freedom, uh, freedoms and utopic spaces? From activist manifestos to artistic imaginings to alternative forms of kinship, Black LGBTQ activists have brought forth what Jose Munoz calls a futurity of queerness, meaning they envision a world that contains their freedom and they work in grassroots movements to manifest that, social, that socially just world in the now. For example, 
activist organizers of Bachi Ku, an event which was started as a Black LGBTQ centered social space in Salvador and has grown into an intersectional grassroots movement for Black LGBTQ people across Brazil, describe the space they are creating as one that, quote, challenges gender roles and societal norms. It's about owning your body and your freedom, end quote. My observations and interviews with uh, have shown me that Black LGBTQ activists are preoccupied with creating, uh, quote, spaces of refuge, to borrow from H Rachel Hardy, Hardy, that allows them to take ownership of their body and subjectivity to experience living a kind of freedom unavailable to them outside of these spaces. Through interviews with Black, queer, and trans activists, I uncover various ways Black LGBTQ activists imagine and live their utopic freedoms utilizing collective activisms and creative imaginations. And finally, diasporic connections. What information flows across the Black queer, and Black queer diaspora are apparent in Black LGBTQ freedom struggles in Brazil and the United States? So I'm interested in how Black queer and trans subjects understand themselves as part of a diasporic movement in the Americas. My preliminary research demonstrated how activists in Brazil util utilize poetry and other literature written by Black LGBTQ pioneers, such as Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, to politically organize a Black LGBTQ community in Brazil. In the United States, the recent assassination of Rio City Councilwoman Marielle Franco sparked emotional statements of solidarity from Black queer organizers in the United States and called activists to understand how Black queer stories in the US and Brazil are correlated. So finally, I wanna talk about some theoretical implications that, that I, I see that my work will have throughout the field. And one of the first ones is thinking through ruptures. So, so thinking through how uh, ruptures in the ruptures of the national space as the only lens through which Black LGBTQ communities can be analyzed. So, how does thinking through both the United States and Brazil at the same time uh, reimagine how we can geographically approach research of Black Black queer and trans communities? Attempts to understand the multi-directional directional flows between the Black queer diaspora and to understand the sometimes quote, uneven, diaspora, uh, uneven encounters to borrow from Nicole Siegel of these flows. Specifically thinking through how US imperialism plays in the flows of the Black queer diaspora. So an intersectional approach paying attention to, the, to, uh, to race, gender, and sexuality in Black activism will shift our contemporary and historical understandings of the Black, global Black radical tradition, which still dominantly remain heteronormative in their approach. So finally, I wanna talk about some political motivations of this work. I consider this research to have political urgency as violence against black LGBTQ activists in Brazil and in the United States grows daily. When Rio City Council was assassinated on her way home on the evening of March 14, 2018, her brutal murder represented the danger for Black LGBTQ people who speak out against the overlapping systems of oppression against which they fight. In her political work, Franco, Franco, Franco denounced femicide, femicide uh, proposed legislation to fight against women on public transportation, to fight against assault on women on public transportation, and urged to stop, uh, urged a stop to deeper understanding and urged a deeper understanding of lesbocide, violence against the lesbian women. She was an unapologetic voice against police violence in favela communities throughout Rio, and stood against ex-president Michel Temer's push for an increased military occupation in the city, which she argued would disproportionately and violently affect the city's poorest residents. She advocated for an official city she advocated for official city recognized days to combat violence against queer communities, against women, and against Black people. Her work embodied the spirit of manifesting freedoms for Black LGBTQ people through fighting the multiple levels of oppression they face. Therefore, her assassination shows the serious threat 
that visions of Black LGBTQ freedom present to white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalist nation states, while also showing the precariousness of Black LGBTQ activists' lives. In the face of this precarity, now more than ever, these stories must be told and, visions, and their visions spread far and wide. But in the clamor to tell these stories, it is also important to ask, who gets to tell these stories? How is my own social positioning as a storyteller reflected or not in the stories I choose to tell? Recently in the release of Netflix documentary on Marsha Johnson, The Life and Death of Mark Ashby Johnson, which came out in 2017, another Black trans activist and artist, Tourmaline Gossip, questioned who gets the support, who gets, who gets the support to tell Black trans women's stories. Lamenting about the stealing of her ideas and archival work recovering the life of Mark P. Johnson by white male director of the by the by, what cis white male director of the documentary, she says, I quote. I'm still lost in the music trying to hashtag pay it no mind and reeling on how this movie came to be and make so much money off of our lives and ideas, end quote. Gossett asked the important question of how people outside of the community write about and capitalize on the lives and deaths of Black, queer, and trans people, stemming from a long history of white elite trained academics robbing Black LGBTQ communities of their story. This problem stems from the lack of reflexivity on the part of the authors and creators of these works on Black, queer, and trans communities and the distance between their own positionality and the, and the subjects that they're researching. Taking these historical and current day wrongs into account, reflections about my own positionality as a Black queer person from the United States must be considered in my own theorization of diaspora, citizenship, and freedom. My own political investments in, the investments in the freedom of my community is central to the questions I ask and to the analytical choices I am making in this research. In this vein, I continually plan to work against the exploitative ways in which Black, queer, and trans communities have been researched by scholars and documentary filmmakers. Finally, traveling between the United States and Brazil and seeing similarities between the Black LGBTQ communities inspired a diasporic approach to the study of Black queer and trans, of Black queer and trans activism. While much has been written uh, presenting a, co a comparative approach between the United States and Brazil, and to name a few, um, uh, Carl Delger's work, Gilberto Freire's work, Michael Hanchard's work, um, Skidmore's work, there's a whole list of works that work through a, co a comparative approach to, to racial relations in the United States and Brazil, or look at racial relationships in Brazil comparing against the United States. Different from that, my project moves instead away from the compare and contrast approach um, to more of a relational lens. Monique A. Badassi's concept of tr uh, trotting diaspora is particularly helpful to conceptualize the ways African descended people uh, cr across borders, um, uh, the ways in which their stories intersect and relate to one another. How can one understand the histories and current day political struggles of Black LGBTQ people beyond the confines of national borders? How do we understand the stories of Black LGBTQ people as well as the systems that oppress them as relational and global? My work moves in line with Latin Americanist scholars who have broken down the boundaries between constructions of race in the Caribbean and Latin America and constructions of race in the United States. Instead of working through a comparative lens which can reinforces national differences, my emphasis on diaspora allows for an understanding of how global black, queer and trans histories are connected. I aim to contribute to the to scholarship that challenges the nation as the only lens through which Black subjects, specifically political subjects, can be analyzed. Understanding intricately what Black LGBTQ freedom and resistance means diasporically allows Black queer and trans activists to see themselves as part of a worldwide movement and communities that stretch beyond their borders. So thank you all for listening to some of the questions and the, and the, preliminary, um, the preliminary themes that I'm coming up with in my research. And I'm excited to talk about the Q&A. Um, 
uh, conversing with Monique and, Ab uh, Monique and Abner's research. But I'm also specifically excited about thinking through this week's, uh, this week's elections in Brazil, um, thinking about the ways in which Black LGBTQ people um, have a lot of victories in this election, but also some of the ways in which this election was disappointing. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Atu Fani, for your outstanding presentation and uh, bring a lot of thought uh, and, uh, you know, raise a lot of uh, interesting questions about uh, um, LGBTQ community in Brazil and U.S. as well. Uh, I, I'd like to invite our audience to ask questions. Uh, you can, you know, ask in Portuguese and uh, we will translate. Also, I'd like to invite a uh, UCSD student to ask a question about, you know, uh, some uh, issues that you would like to, to understand more because uh, in Brazil, in US, uh, in somehow we have a, a sort of uh, racial democracy myth, right? It's not just uh, uh, you know an uh, exception. It's not so uh, only for Brazil. Uh, U.S. also had this sort of. Uh, there are a lot of students. There are a lot of uh, you know um, uh, research about this issue. Even Professor. Jessica Grant, uh, who is my advisor here, published last year in the OMA Prize about uh, racial democracy in Brazil, in the US, as well uh, throughout the 30s and 40s. And uh, thank you, Lato, to remind us uh, and bring uh, Professor Anani Dizenu for this uh, round table. Professor Dizenio passed away uh, in this uh, month. Uh, Professor Dizenio, his uh, important role to, uh, you know, improve uh, Afro-Brazilian studies He in U.S. Uh, he was in the most, you know, uh, incredible figure uh, that study um, Afro-Brazilian. I myself took two courses with, uh, with him that changed my subject uh, of study, that changed my perspective about uh, Brazilian history and things like that. So um, thank you to, to bring Professor Nani for this uh, round table. And I know uh, he is with us. So uh, we have, a, hopefully, we have a question here. Uh, the first question I'd like to address uh, to Monique, uh, Monique Paula. Uh, and the question, uh, Monique, what kind of uh, difficult did you find to research Black women in Brazil political field, you know. Uh, so, despite the fact that uh, you know political or official political arena, it's so white, and uh, uh, also it's like a masculine uh, environment. So, what kind of uh, difficulties? Did you find to research black women in Brazil political field? And uh, another question is for is to Watu, what funny after Monique. Can you tell us about your methodological approach to your research? Tell us about the communities and the people with whom you were doing research. You access the social place and the position of this group 
what is your method? So uh, let's start with Monique. So is uh, thank you for the question. Uh, that is, there are a lot of uh, difficulty for black women uh, in our society, uh, especially Brazil in this, uh, in this actually context. Uh, but uh, I, I, I focus on in some, some of them. One is uh, Brazil is a um, a, a, a violence, uh, violence place, country for the uh, for the Roman or Roman uh, struggle for Roman uh, right, Roman rights, uh, and the Roman uh, is dangerous for all the people defend the uh, Roman rights. And the other other difficult is the is the the visible uh, in the in the face about the uh, the black women is invisible in the our our society is the expression of the racism. Uh, that's why uh, how the the Black women uh, to 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 show the the to show the the actions to show the to show the possibility to to transform the the community how the how the how the the black women uh, show show us show us for the community and the community can vote. The community uh, can, can know about the proposal of, black, the, of the black, black, black women. And the other, uh, other difficult is the money. It's necessary money uh, to, to show the proposal, to show the action, to show the, to show the action in the Congress uh, is the money and the, the social media can play one possibility to show this, this action, this, this show this proposal, uh, to show the, all the, the activities uh, in the Congress, in the, out the street, out the community, out the, uh, abroad the institu institutional uh, extract. Um, these are some of the difficulty. Um, invisibility uh, is an expression of the racism. Uh, the danger of the, all, the, all the person, all the, the, the people uh, struggle, uh, struggle for uh, Roman, uh, Roman rights, uh, the communication, nah? the communication because the social media can play a, a, a possibility because the, uh, the traditional, the traditional media in Brazil uh, is so hard to, 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 uh, to, um, to information about the other other question, uh, especially black people, and the, this is uh, uh, a scenario for difficult for black women. Great. I, I, I hope it, I hope they, they they answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll launch into the next question. And I actually wanted to piggyback back off of something Moniki was saying. So the question that I'm gonna answer is about methodology and, and I'm actually excited, me and Monique will have to converse afterwards because I also converse a lot with social media specifically because of the ways in which social media opens a space for 
for Black people in general, but specifically with the communities I'm dealing with, Black LGBTQ people, to, to find a safe space um, to, to, to be able to connect with one another and talk with one another. So in a lot of my interviews, folks have talked about how the first place, even before there was any physical space for Black LGBTQ people like Bashiku, the first place where they found a kind of connection with one another was through social media. So social media has really had an extreme importance, especially with this latest generation of, um, of Black activists. Um, so moving on to, to my methodological approach, um, I've been blessed in my committee to have a kind of interdisciplinary makeup of my committee. So with two really strong um, anthropologists and a, and a super strong historian, my project has really come to be a, an ethno-historic project. So barring from Jay Lorenzo Torrey's um, construction of, of, of ethno-historic methods, um, I'm really thinking through um, both the contemporary and the historical moment through um, ethnographic uh, investigations, oral history, um, and textual analysis of the archive. Um, and especially uh, Black LGBTQ people's personal archives. Um, in addition, I also um, make use of performance studies methods, thinking about um, reading the, the, the performance of self, um, and the performance of the body, the politicality of the body. And so these are all things that I'm using in, in the kind of methodological approach of my research. Um, in terms of the communities that I'm interacting with for my research, up until now, I, I've conducted about 60 um, ethnographic interviews with Black LGBTQ activists split across, the, split across urban spaces in the United States and Brazil. Um, specifically the spaces that I've been in Brazil are Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Salvador. In the United States, uh, New York, Philadelphia, and the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and so those are the, the spaces and the people that I'm using to talk to. Um, and in terms of my access to these social spaces, um, wh what have I encountered in terms of trying to access these groups? Um, I do a lot of reading in, in, in my work, not just on you know, the research that I've, I've produced, but also a kind of um, research on, a, a kind of read on method. Um, because for instance, one of the things that I found is the conversation about my own so, social position and my own experiences as, the black, uh, as a black queer person um, has been essential to be able to gain access to certain communities. So uh, I remember when I was interviewing um, uh, Wilson Mandela, who was the founder of, one of, uh, of the first uh, black gay group in Brazil founded in Salvador, Adedudu, one of the things that he shared with me is that he gets a lot of requests to, to do interviews and he turns down most of them uh, because his own political um, approach to who is he going to share this story with is that he wants to share this story with someone from his community. Um, you know, it's still a gamble if you're sharing it with someone from your community, but he felt, um, as told to me, that sharing it with someone in his community makes it less of a gamble than sharing it with someone outside of his community. Um, so me, my, my own identity as a Black queer person, but also sharing um, my, my, my experiences, my processes as a Black queer person, as a Black queer activist, um, has been essential to gain, act uh, gain access to space and to gain trust. Um, so yeah, so that's a couple of, I, I, I'm not sure if I answered the whole question, but we can come back to it. Um, but, but so that's a little bit about where my method comes from. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Atu, Fanny, and Monique. Uh, I hope you guys uh, enjoy this uh, panel today. And uh, also, you know, be in touch with Monique, with what Fanny, uh, with me, to have uh, a lot of uh, interest about Brazilian uh, race and, uh, you know, resistance in Brazil nowadays. I would like to invite Professor uh, Erica Larkin to, you know, last word. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, thank you so much, Monique, Watufani, Abner, um, and thank you to everyone that worked to make this event possible. It was wonderful, um, and we hope it's the first of many conversations. So thank yeah. you again, and uh, and good night. I know it's late in Rio, so <laughs> yeah, <it is. laughs> thank you for being awake. <laughs> thank you all. Thanks so much. Have a good thank one. You. Bye bye. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. <laughs>